Well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming out on a beautiful Friday night. I'm, a, I'm amazed that you're here. Uh, I had a real feeling of deja vu all over again, watching the hearings the other night of Gina Haspel. And I kept thinking, you know, that it was not too long ago that I was in a hearing room like that testifying against Robert Gates, who never should have been returned to the CIA because he was politicizing intelligence during the whole Reagan administration. And you would think that when you do something like that, return someone who has politicized intelligence to an agency to then direct it, the kind of cynicism uh, that results among the people who watch this person come back. And in Gina Haspel, or as bloody Gina as some of us used to know her or refer to her, the idea that someone was so involved, who was so central uh, in the torture and abuse and so central in the destruction of the torture tapes to have her go back as apparently she will and will probably vote next week uh, is extremely discouraging. Uh, but anyway, let me tell you about uh, why I wrote the book in terms of whistleblowing, why I think whistleblowing is important and why I think the book might be uh, useful. I have a very simple definition of whistleblowing and that is uh, trying to correct a wrong. Uh, and in my definition, I even create space for people like James Comey and Sally Yates, who last uh, May and June 2017, uh, I think, in an act of whistleblowing, uh, talked about uh, what was happening during the Trump campaign and the cover-up that has ensued uh, since then. And the only reason why I mentioned Comey, because to me, it's cl he's a classic whistleblower in that he has received so much opposition. Uh, from liberals, not just conservatives, for a book, if you haven't read it, I know I should be talking about my own book, but I think you ought to read Higher Loyalty even before you, you get the whistleblower book. It's a very important work. Uh, and I think people have dwelled on one factor, his role in handling the Hillary Clinton emails, uh, but have ignored his attempts to stop massive surveillance, a violation of the Constitution, to stop torture and abu abuse, a violation of the Constitution, and if Hillary Clinton had misused her powers in handling uh, these very sensitive materials, that case never would have come up uh, before the Justice Department in the first place. But the book is extremely important. He is a very heroic and honorable uh, individual. And I think what is true in the case of most whistleblowing uh, is people pay uh, a rather high price uh, for their efforts. The ones I've known and it's true for myself, uh, would do it again, uh, but you do pay a price for that. You do become isolated to a certain extent. Now, when I think about whistleblowing, I think of all of the things we learn from whistleblowers. Uh, we don't always know who the whistleblowers are, but we certainly know who the journalists are. Uh, and when you think of Seymour Hersh, who's probably one of the finest investigative reporters uh, of our time, uh, and you think of Mi Lai and KAL 007 and Abu Ghraib, uh, these are things that we needed to know about as citizens. Uh, violations of national security didn't pl take place in educating us about these things, but it was whistleblowers who did that. And in some of these cases, KL-007, which was the, involved the shoot-down of a Korean airliner, I don't even know who the whistleblowers are because Seymour Hersh managed to talk to people at the National Security Agency, who at that time rarely talked to anybody. Uh, in the press to show how the government very intentionally misused very sensitive uh, documents. When I think of Woodward and Bernstein, I mean, the, the Washington Post has been living off of uh, their work for the last 40 years, as far as uh, I'm concerned. And it's kind of ironic when you think of the whistleblower in that case, uh, because Richard Nixon uh, called in his chief of staff at the time, Robert Haldeman, and said, do we know who the whistleblower is? And Haldeman said, yeah, I think we do. It's Mark Felt of the FBI. And Nixon only asked one question, is, is he Jewish? Uh, and the response from Haldeman was, no, I think he's Catholic. And that was the end of the conversation. And I think it was another 30 years that went by before he learned it was indeed uh, Mark Felt. Uh, the two recent uh, whistleblowers who I think are important are somewhat controversial. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about them. Uh, and that would be Thomas Drake uh, and Chelsea Manning. And the reason why they're so controversial as far as uh, I'm concerned is that they released more materials 
uh, and uh, spoke about more issues than the very topic that they were focusing on. In the case of um, uh, Edward Snowden, did I say Tom Drake? I, I'm sorry, I meant to say Edward Snowden and, and Chelsea Manning. I'll get to Drake later on. Uh, Edward Snowden, I think, was exposing unconstitutional behavior, illegal searches and seizure, seizures by the National Security Agency. That was the Stellar Wind uh, program. But Snowden also released a lot of material that dealt with very legitimate uh, collection. And so I think for a lot of people, and even for me it presents a bit of a quandary, uh, that this was a, a less than honorable act of whistleblowing. But someone like Eric Holder, the former Attorney General, referred to Edward Snowden as a public servant uh, once he left Washington. Uh, Holder didn't make this description while he was the Attorney General, but he did come to the conclusion that Snowden indeed uh, was a public servant. Chelsea Manning, I would say the same thing. When you look at the material that she released, it dealt with war crimes, the war crimes that were taking place in Iraq. And she even released some video footage. Some of you may have seen it on uh, YouTube. Uh, but she also released hundreds of thousands of State Department cables. I read a couple thousand of those cables. They weren't sensitive by any means. They were a very low classification. Uh, but it created problems in trying to defend Chelsea Man Manning, and eventually she ended up uh, in jail. But I think even Barack Obama had a certain amount of guilt feelings about the way Chelsea Manning uh, was handled, because I think it violated the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution about a fair and free trial, which I don't think she got uh, the, in the hands of the military. Uh, and he uh, commuted her, her sentence. And now she's uh, living not far from us in, in Maryland and running for the Senate against Benjamin Cardin. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting story to keep up with uh, Chelsea Manning. The reason why I want to mention Tom Drake just briefly is Tom Drake, and that name not, may not be as familiar to you as some of the others, he was one of the original whistleblowers at the National Security Agency on the massive surveillance uh, program. And Drake did everything that a whistleblower is supposed to do. And I think it's important to understand that because I think it helps to explain why Edward Snowden uh, basically left the country. Because he knew he was safer outside of the country than he was inside the country. And frankly, when I think about it, the fact that he's safer in Russia than he is in the United States tells you something about both societies at this particular point uh, in time. But Tom Drake went to his bosses at the National Security Agency. He went to inspector generals at the NSA and the Pentagon. He went to the House Intelligence Committee. And there was a staffer, Diane Rowark, who said to Tom, you know, if you want to get this story out, uh, you're going to have to go to the press. And he talked to uh, a woman from the Baltimore Sun, Siobhan uh, Gorman, who I think now writes for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and what the government did and I have to say the Obama administration, that's one of my great disappointments with Obama. I thought we were electing a civil libertarian when I voted for Obama. Uh, he used the Espionage Act uh, against Tom Drake. That very case was on George Bush's desk and he refused to pursue it. He didn't send it to the Justice Department, uh, but Barack Obama did. And what the government did, which led the judge to essentially throw the case out of court, was to take documents that had de been declassified and reclassify them. Uh, and the judge was furious about this and lectured the government lawyers that, you know, this isn't the Soviet Union. We don't, we, we don't do this uh, in this country. But Tom Drake, under the Espionage Act, was facing 35 years uh, in prison. And when you look at Obama's record, he used the Espionage Act more than all presidents combined from the time the Espionage Act was passed in 1917 up to the president. Uh, so about eight different individuals have faced uh, prosecution under the terms of the Espionage Act for essentially whistleblowing. Uh, and I think it's a, a terrible misuse uh, of the law. Now, the importance of whistleblowing, I think, uh, is, is central to the importance of investigative journalism. You, you cannot have investigative journalism in this country uh, without whistleblowing. And to me, you cannot have a vigorous democracy in this country, and I think our democracy now is severely challenged. Uh, without uh, whistleblowing. Um, when I think of, of journalists who've uh, taken advantage of this, people like Woodward and Bernstein, uh, Cy Hirsch I mentioned before, but if you go to the editorials of key newspapers, they are extremely unfriendly uh, to whistleblowers. And my special gripe is with the Washington Post, my own local hometown uh, newspaper, because 
series of editorials, including the editor of the editorial page, Fred Hyatt, has been very critical of whistleblowers. Michael Gerson, who's an op-ed writer for the Washington Post, uh, who shouldn't be because he was George Bush's speechwriter and the infamous Axis of Evil speech was written by Michael Gerson, he referred to whistleblowers as nut jobs. Uh, Richard Cohn, who was supposed to be a, a liberal uh, journalist, uh, referred to Chelsea Manning as a cross-dressing Little Red Riding Hood in a particularly nasty uh, column. And Ruth Marcus referred to Edward Snowden as an extremely unsavory uh, character. Uh, and I think of someone who is fairly well known to people who keep up with these op-eds, David Ignatius, who's been an apologist for the CIA for the last 20, 30 years. He wrote a column just in the wake of the Haspel uh, nomination talking about what a hard choice it is to try to decide uh, whether you should vote for or against Gene Aspel. I think the choice is a rather simple one here in terms of the immorality of torture and abuse and her heavy hand uh, in all of it and the destruction uh, of the torture tapes. I'm not um, comparing my own whistleblowing uh, with some of the people that I've talked about, but I think it's important to understand that when the CIA politicizes intelligence, uh, this is something that the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee uh, should take seriously. Uh, and what you had in the 1980s in the Reagan administration was heavy politicization of intelligence. When we elected Reagan, uh, we had a president who wanted more than anything else to increase defense spending. And he engaged in the largest peacetime increase in defense spending of any president uh, we've ever had. And to justify defense spending when you're not at war, you need an adversary who's 10 feet tall. And the Russians serve that purpose. Uh, for Ronald Reagan, he appointed an ideological CIA director, uh, Bill Casey. Bill Casey, in turn, had an ideological uh, deputy, Robert Gates. And Robert Gates was sort of the filter for politicizing intelligence. And there were several of us, including my wife, Lynn, and several others, some who uh, submitted sworn affidavits that she did to the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, who exposed the misuse of intelligence. Here was the Soviet Union in 1981, beginning a decade of decline, economic decline, political decline, that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. And we didn't anticipate that, but we were right about the decline of the Soviet Union. And during that very important period when we could have created serious arms control and disarmament negotiations and maybe changed the strategic balance uh, for American foreign policy, we were engaging in this incredible expansion uh, of the defense budget. And I think when I look at American politics and you look at American electoral campaigns, how often the, the Soviet Union has become that target that we've used to justify defense spending. You know, Eisenhower had to face this in the 50s with the bomber gap. And fortunately, given his military background, uh, he ignored a lot of the phony intelligence about uh, uh, greater uh, capabilities for the Soviet Union than really existed. Uh, John F. Kennedy did the same thing in the 1960 election when he talked about a missile gap. Yeah, there was a missile gap. The Soviets only had four intercontinental ballistic missiles at that time. And Nixon was furious. He went to Eisenhower and said that Kennedy is uh, misusing this information and it's been very successful on the campaign trail. Why can't the CIA brief him and show him the exact numbers of relative military strength of, among the, you know, the Soviet forces and the U.S. forces? And actually Eisenhower finally agreed and allowed the CIA to brief Kennedy, but Kennedy was having so much success with this campaign uh, position, even though he knew it was dishonest, uh, he maintained it. And in the Reagan administration, they brought in an ideological professor from Harvard, Richard Pipes, a name that's sure, I'm sure familiar to a lot of you. Uh, and Pipes wrote about uh, the, the intentions gap. The intentions gap was Pipes' strong feeling that was totally polemical, that the Soviets believed they could fight and win a nuclear war. Um, and during this period of the 80s, because of people like Pipes uh, in the NSC and Robert Gates at the CIA, we saw a tremendous exaggeration of uh, Soviet capabilities and Soviet intentions. Uh, there were phony papers written about the Soviet role in the uh, assassination plot against the Pope in 1981. 
uh, phony papers done on Soviet support for international terrorism, on the Soviet economy, on the Soviet uh, military. So the whistleblowing that was important, I think, uh, in 91 in getting this issue to the Senate Intelligence Committee, which did lead to more votes against Robert Gates than all other CIA directors combined from 1947 to 91, 47, the year the CIA was uh, created. Now, the other reason why whistleblowing is so important, and let me just talk about this for a minute or two, uh, is the fact that our, our democracy is being severely challenged now on several fronts. And the aspect that concerns me the most is that the guardrails of democracy that we count on uh, to keep our democracy uh, vigorous, I think in some cases are, are not working. Two, I think, do not get sufficient attention. One is in the hands of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees, which are responsible for oversight from outside the intelligence community. And then another institution, which is inside the intelligence community, which is the Office of the Inspector General, uh, which has been greatly weakened over the years. Now, if you look at the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, this is a classic example of the Republicans taking leadership uh, once they won the Senate. Uh, and won the House. So you now you have Republican chairman of those two important committees that were created after the Church Committee hearings in the 1970s when you had the same violations of the Constitution that you have now with massive surveillance. And I think that's been forgotten to a large extent. The 1970s, COINTELPRO, an illegal FBI program. Uh, the Operation Shamrock, an illegal NSA program. Uh, op uh, the Operation Chaos, an illegal CIA uh, program. Uh, these, all of these programs involved illegal uh, wiretaps, illegal surveillance, mail openings, and this, all of this was exposed by the Church Committee and it led to the creations of these intelligence committees. But now in the hands of the Republicans, you can see in the case of the House, Devin Nunes, uh, he is acting as a defense attorney uh, for Donald Trump in the way he's handling classified material. Uh, and Richard Burr, the Senate Intelligence Committee chairman, uh, he has taken that very important authoritative work that Senator Dianne Feinstein was responsible for, a 6,000-page authoritative study of the illegal torture uh, and abuse program. And what must be kept in mind when someone like Gina Haspel uh, argues, as she did in her confirmation hearings, that what we did may have been immoral, uh, she wouldn't really firmly say that, but she said it was legal. No, it was never legal. And James Comey exposed the illegality of those memos that were written by John Yu and Jay Bybee. Uh, Bybee was rewarded with a federal judgeship out here on the West Coast, and John Yu teaches law, of all things, at the University of California Law School uh, at Berkeley. But the important thing to recognize is the CIA went way beyond what those uh, torture memoranda talked about uh, in the first place. So there was nothing legal about the program uh, in any way, and it shouldn't have been discussed on the basis of whether or not torture worked. Torture was wrong, whether it worked or not. In this case, it didn't work, and the Feinstein report uh, exposed all that. The lies that went to the White House from the CIA about the results of torture uh, and abuse, but the report itself was recalled by Richard Burr, the Senate chairman, uh, and who knows if it will ever see uh, light of day. Uh, the other guardrail, the Office of the Inspector General, is an extremely important institution for correcting wrongdoing from within uh, these agencies. Uh, the example I always cite because of the controversy over the Hillary Clinton emails, uh, which James Comey may have mishandled to a certain extent, but it was a problem that she created, uh, she didn't have an Inspector General at the State Department in the four years that she was the steward for American uh, diplomacy. She refused to have an Inspector General. And my thinking was maybe if a prominent Inspector General had been at the State Department at that particular time, that is someone who could have convinced Hillary Clinton that what you're doing is wrong. Uh, because James Comey said what was crucial to whether she could be prosecuted or not was finding a do document that she ignored that firmly stated that she could not create her own email server and keep this in her home uh, in upstate New York. Uh, now, she was told it was wrong, but there was no document that could be uh, found. But it's the Office of the Inspector General that is responsible for exposing this kind of uh, uh, wrongdoing. Uh, again, 
just to, to cite my wife's case, she was at the, the Office of the Inspector General and responsible for the report on 9-11 that showed a lot of the uh, intelligence failures that led or enabled 9-11 to take place and to expose some of the illegalities of the rendition program. Uh, it's important for citizens to understand all of this information. It doesn't compromise our national security. It doesn't compromise our sovereignty. This is information I feel we are entitled to know. And I'm not aware of any case where any information that was revealed uh, was harmful to American national security. And in some cases, uh, well, Daniel Ellsberg is a very important case in this regard, the Pentagon Papers. When he decided to copy the Pentagon Papers, his intention was not to turn these over to the media. He sent them to two prominent senators, including William Fulbright, the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who was so opposed to the Vietnam War. Fulbright was, was so nervous in receiving these Pentagon Papers that he returned them uh, to Daniel Ellsberg. It was at that point that someone said to Ellsberg, just as Drake was told by uh, Diane Roark, if you want to get this information out there, uh, you have to go to the uh, New York Times. So even though the movie that has recreated Ellsberg's career deals with the Post, uh, it was the Times. Uh, the Post is probably a more interesting story because of Catherine Graham, but the key to the story and the movie opens with the role that Daniel Ellsberg uh, played. Um, the other guardrails that I worry about uh, are the, the media. Uh, even though the media is making a comeback now, uh, ever since Trump was inaugurated, I noticed the masthead of the Washington Post now says democracy dies in darkness, very reminiscent, uh, reminiscent of the uh, novels by Philip Roth and Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair, it can't happen here. Uh, Philip Roth, the plot to kill America, uh, which really carry the warnings of what we're going through now uh, in terms of an administration that is trying to attack truth, trying to attack science, uh, trying to attack fact, uh, which makes it uh, even more important to have whistleblowers at this particular uh, time. You know, some of the things that have happened just in the past year and a half of this Trump administration that are not well known, that rarely get any attention, are quite stunning in, in terms of the vigor of our governance, and that is the attack on science. You know, we think about it in terms of the climate accord that he has pulled us out of, making us the only government on Earth, the only nation on Earth that is not part of the climate accord. Uh, at one time, there were two other nations that weren't a part of it, Nicaragua and Syria. Nicaragua didn't sign up because they thought it wasn't tough enough. Uh, Syria didn't sign up for various reasons, but both did. So we're the only ones standing outside of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, but if you look at scientific advisors in the various regulatory agencies, what is happening at EPA, the fact that he's never appointed a science advisor uh, is stunning to me. This is a very important position uh, in the government. Uh, and we've seen all presidents, uh, Democrats and Republicans, have had very influential uh, science advisors. Uh, the final point I would make uh, is that the emphasis on national security and the national security state has become so overwhelming that this is another reason for why whistleblowers uh, are essential. And here I look at the way the defense budget uh, has been handled and the increases in the defense budget and the lack of any real criticism of this. Uh, Trump increased the defense budget and submitted to the Congress uh, a bill for $686 billion, roughly, for defense. Congress took that, raised it to $716 billion because they look at the defense budget as a, a jobs program for their own constituencies. But if you add the other aspects of the defense community, the Veterans, Veterans Administration, the second largest uh, agency in government, uh, that's a budget of another $186 billion. And if you look at the Department of Energy, which deals mainly with nuclear weapons, safeguarding nuclear weapons and nuclear technology, that's part of the defense establishment. And if you look at the $70 billion intelligence budget, 85% uh, of that is administered by the Defense Department. It's really part of the defense budget. So we're spending way over a trillion dollars for defense. And what I found fascinating about the, the Trump increase in defense spending uh, which called for $51 billion, uh, additional spending of $51 billion, uh, 
that's equal to the entire Russian defense budget. Uh, our defense budget probably equals the defense spending of the next 12 to 15 uh, countries. And if you look at global powers, there is really only one global power uh, in, in the international arena. That's the United States with its 700 to 800 military facilities around the world. China has one, uh, a facility they're building in Djibouti. Uh, and part of that was really uh, inspired by the need to join the Western world as a stakeholder in the battle against piracy uh, in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. And if you look at Russia, the only two facilities they have outside of the uh, former Soviet space is Syria. Uh, and that's a naval facility at TARDIS and an air facility at Latakia. And again, the United States is everywhere in tremendous numbers. And if you want to hear, I think, what the, what the problem is in a very simple fashion, let me just read, and I want to get this right, so let me just read this quotation. Uh, see if you know who said this. But if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall. We see further. We see further than other countries into the future. Our nation's memory is long and our reach is further. Do you know who said that? That was Madeleine Albright 20 years ago in 1998. But I think that uh, really captures the exceptionalism of American thinking in the international arena that has created so many problems for U.S. interests. Can I ask you to read that one more time? Now yeah. That I know who wrote it. Now that you know who wrote it, <laughs> would you have guessed Madeleine Albright? No. <laughs> Good. Uh, but if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall. We see further. We see further than other countries into the future. Our nation's memory is long, and our reach is further. And remember, she was the uh, Secretary of State in the 1990s when she was trying to push the Clinton administration to get more involved uh, in the Balkans, uh, the problems in Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, and she went after Secre uh, Secretary of Defense Colin Powell, or well, he was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, and basically quoting Lincoln and McClellan said, what's the good of this military that you're always praising if you're afraid to use it? Of course, Colin Powell was furious with that remark. And I might add, uh, since in addition to my 24 years at CIA, I taught at the National War College for 18 years, uh, the military is never responsible for these unwinnable wars that we talk about. In fact, when you think of these disasters over the last 40, 50 years, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and you think of how many years of war and the fact that we are, we're in permanent war now, uh, the military always offer the case in all three of those for why uh, constraint would be a better approach and we need to uh, use diplomacy. Now, once you give the military the command uh, in terms of these wars, these are wars they want to win, it becomes a matter of will. Uh, but wars, you know, to, to go back to David Halberstam's wonderful book, The Best and the Brightest, these are civilians. Uh, and for the most part, usually civilians who have no experience with the military whatsoever. And if you look today, one of the alarming things about the national security state is the degree to which Trump has surrounded himself with the military, you know, the so-called adults in the room. Uh, Secretary of Defense a general, the Chief of Staff is a general, the National Security Advisor, the first two were generals, Department of Homeland Security a general. They haven't officially named him, but uh, he's about to be nominated. The Admiral Howe, the head of Admiral Harris, the head of the Pacific Command, uh, is going to be the ambassador to South Korea. Uh, he's someone who the Obama administration had to gag during Obama's terms in office because of his warlike rhetoric in dealing with China. Um, so th th this military and militarization of national security policy, of diplomacy, even Mike Pompeo, okay, uh, he's not uh, a career military officer, but he went to West Point and served in the military. Uh, for six years. Uh, it's a very dangerous trend. So let me open it up to your questions and comments and see where you want to take this. Yeah. Yeah, a question deals with um, Dick Cheney's um, statement the other day 
to resume enhanced interrogation techniques, which is to resume torture and abuse. You know, it was Dick Cheney, uh, who after 9-11, and in a sense he was true to his word, who said, we've got to go on the dark side. Uh, and he had a lawyer by the name of David Ad Addington, who I think is the villain of the piece, uh, who put together a lot of the memos uh, that allowed torture and abuse and created the massive surveillance program. And one of the real, uh, really interesting parts of the Comey book is when Comey went to the White House to confront Cheney and to confront Addington. Uh, and he was confronting them about the uh, memoranda in support of massive surveillance. And he, he told Cheney, which I thought was rather courageous, that no lawyer would ever approve these memos. And David Addington, who was sitting in the back row, said, uh, I'm a lawyer and I approve those memos. And Comey's response was, no good lawyer. Um, I think even Bush realized toward the end, it took him too long, uh, that Dick Cheney was creating serious difficulties for the Bush presidency and for the United States. Uh, I think Cheney, more than anyone else, was behind the war uh, against Iraq. He was behind the phony intelligence uh, that got us into that war, that justified that war, made it easier to enter that war, and it was kind of interesting that uh, just a few weeks ago when uh, Trump pardoned Scooter Libby, he was Dick Cheney's chief of staff, uh, who was involved in the outing of Valerie Plain. Uh, that was an obvious, well, it was more than a dog whistle, it was like a symphonic orchestration to people around Trump now, like uh, Manafort and Michael Cohen and others, that you're gonna be pardoned. Just stay silent, you don't have to cooperate. Uh, with the Justice Department or the Mueller investigation at this time, uh, just as he pardoned uh, Scooter Libby, someone he probably was not familiar with at all. He's never shown any interest, according to the Justice Department, uh, in the, in the uh, pardon program, uh, that he was signaling that this is what they can expect. If you haven't read it, the, uh, the Barton Gelman book, The Angler, it's a biography of Dick Cheney. It's, it's outstanding very dangerous uh, individual. Uh, yeah, why did Dick Cheney want to start the Iraq War? You know, in doing a book before, the whistleblower book, I did a book called National Insecurity, The Cost of American Mil Militarism. And one of the questions I wanted to answer was, why in the world did we do something as stupid <laughs> as invading uh, Iraq, which is the source of all of the misery that we're seeing now being played out uh, in the Middle East. And I read all of the, uh, uh, the memoirs. Uh, Bush had a memoir, Condi Rice had a memoir, Donald Rumsfeld uh, had a memoir to try to get an answer to that question of, of why that war at that particular time. And the conclusion I came to, that, but I could never, I could never prove it with uh, documentary uh, evidence, uh, but I did argue it in the book, is that going back to the 1970s, and remember when uh, Gerald Ford took over the presidency when Nixon resigned, uh, the two key officials he had around him were Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, the chief of staff and the secretary of defense respectively, uh, believed that in the Vietnam War, the presidency gave up too much of its power. Uh, that we had to recreate a more powerful presidency. And the way you create a more powerful presidency is to create a wartime president. This is what I worry about now uh, in terms of Donald Trump. When, when will he reach the point where he will face so much opposition, not only legal opposition, but political op opposition, because that's the key crunch point. When can you take all of this legal evidence that Mueller is accumulating, and I'm sure it's overwhelming. We don't have any idea of what it is, but we have a, uh, an idea of the tip of the iceberg here. But how do you turn that into a political case? Uh, you know, when will Trump feel that it will be military action? That's why so many of us uh, are concerned about walking away from the Iran Comprehensive Plan uh, of Action, uh, because it creates, if you wanted to create the case for military confrontation with Iran, that's a, a very good first step. And if you look at what's happened in the wake uh, of uh, the repudiation of the Iran Comprehensive Plan of Action, just look at what just happened uh, in Syria with the Israeli attack against all of the Iranian facilities. I'm sure Israel feels 
uh, it has a free hand now with regard to Iran, that they have the backing of the American president. And what's interesting, I, I said earlier that uh, George Bush finally realized that Dick Cheney was creating a lot of difficulty for his administration. In 2007, that's when the intelligence community found belatedly the fact that a nuclear reactor had been built in Syria, probably by North Korea, uh, that Israel wanted us to bomb. And the Israelis sent officials, Netanyahu sent officials to this country, and Cheney was willing to authorize military use, and it was Bush who said, I'm not going to be involved in that. Netanyahu wanted Israel to do it, but he couldn't get the support of his military leaders and his intelligence uh, chiefs to make uh, the case initially. Finally, he won the day. Uh, and of course, they bombed the, the nuclear reactor uh, in Syria. Um, but that, that's what would concern me. You know, wh at, to, at what point will Trump uh, come to the conclusion that military action is in the interest of the United States, but more importantly, in the interest of this particular American president? Because when you look at the various wars, and that's what's so sad about reading uh, the memoirs, Lyndon Johnson knew the Vietnam War was wrong and couldn't be won. But he didn't want to be the first president to lose uh, a military confrontation. Nixon knew it from the very beginning, and an additional 33,000 Americans died during the Nixon presidency, but he knew the war could not be won. Afghanistan, we've been there for 17 years. Uh, nothing's been achieved. Yeah, well, that's a good question, dealing with the positive outcome from acts of uh, whistleblowing. Um, let me start with an example that's not recent whistleblowing. But I think the Daniel Ellsberg case of the Pentagon Papers, remember the Pentagon Papers were put together as a history uh, at a time when Robert McNamara knew that the Vietnam War was a huge mistake. And of course, that's when he wore out his welcome with Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson forced him out of the uh, Pentagon as Secretary of Defense, and he became head of the World Bank. Uh, and he felt it was very important to have an historical record. And I think in a democracy, uh, in order to have some kind of accountability. I'm not saying you're ever going to be able to prosecute people who, even if they were war criminals, but we should at least have an understanding of what went wrong. You have this in other societies. South Africa had a reconciliation committee. The East European regimes, when the Warsaw Pact broke up in 1990, had reconciliation committees to find out what in the world happened uh, to make sure it can't happen again, uh, which is really why you want to have some kind of uh, study or account accountability. So I think the Ellsberg case is a very good example. Now Snowden, who's been essentially, I think, ignored in this country, he's a hero in Europe. I mean, the Europeans have been through periods like this. Uh, they remember authoritarian uh, regimes in their own political lifetime. And they know it was important for Snowden to expose uh, not only illegal behavior, but unconstitutional behavior. The National Security Agency was created in secret, dangerous to begin with, by Truman, unlike the CIA, which was created openly in 1947 in the National Security Act. NSA was created secretly, but it was firmly committed to foreign intelligence, that you couldn't monitor and surveil the activities of American citizens. Uh, and it's this anonymity that wasn't being protected. That's why Drake became a whistleblower. That's why Bill Binney became a whistleblower. And there are people like Kurt Wybe, probably names that aren't well known uh, at all. And then ultimately Edward Snowden. Uh, so I think it's important that we understand that. But probably there are, there's more surveillance of American citizens now, even with the rewriting of the Patriot Act. The so-called reform, I don't think has been much of a reform. So. I think the problem in answering your question is, I think there's a lot that is there to learn, but Americans have not been very zealous in trying to learn these lessons. And this is what worries me, that we have become so cynical about the size and pervasive quality of the government that we feel we have no role to play in challenging government uh, excesses. Uh, but that's an extremely good question. It's, a, it's important to keep that in mind in terms of what do we learn because there's a case out there now. It'll be, you'll read more about it in the next few months. It'll come to um, uh, public attention. A reality winner. This was the young American uh, woman at the National Security Agency who released a document to a magazine called Intercept. Uh, 
she was immediately uh, arrested. She's in jail now. And I think the government is going to try to make a huge example of her. And what was the document she arrested, uh, revealed? It was the document that uh, corroborated the idea that the Russians were trying not only to weaponize information that they had gotten from the Democratic National Committee, but they were trying to break into state voter rolls and had targeted at least 14 to 18 states. Now, I don't call her a whistleblower because I don't know what wrong she was trying to correct, but you have to wonder how sensitive is that information now if it's now being discussed in the New York Times and will have to be discussed in her trial. Um, so she's going to pay a terrible price, I guess, under the Espionage Act uh, for what she did. Yeah. Another good question. You know, how do you make the, um, the various acts of whistleblowing um, translated into some political contribution to make the system of governance more efficient? Here there's a certain irony in that whistleblowers are either condemned or forgotten or in some cases we never knew who they were in the first place. But they give information to reporters who then go on to win uh, awards for their work. Uh, Thomas Drake was pursued in the Espionage Act and was wiped out financially. He's still trying to make his, his way back. Gorman won all sorts of prizes for her work. So the, the institution I point to uh, in most cases like this to make this work uh, more transparent and more permanent, uh, it's the media doesn't stay with these stories. Uh, there's no follow-up uh, to these stories. These stories become forgotten uh, very quickly. And I blame the press on that, and I blame really the mainstream uh, media. Uh, when I was testifying against Gates in, in 91, the White House started leaking uh, falsely negative information about me, and I was annoyed. I said, well, I can play that game too. So I started leaking to the Washington Post, Benjamin Weiser, who's now with the Times, and Elaine Cialino with the Times. And Weiser pretty much stuck with what I told him. Elaine Cialino for the first week did, and then she sort of dropped what I was giving her, and her uh, emphasis was on Robert Gates and stories that supported the Gates confirmations. So I, I called her when the hearings were over, and I asked her to have lunch, had an agenda, and halfway to lunch, I said, Elaine, it was pretty obvious that you dropped me midway through. Why? Uh, and she said, well, it was clear to me that Gates was going to be confirmed. He was going to go to the CIA as a director and become a very important source. She was a national security reporter. You were going to go back to teaching at the National War College, and I'd probably never call you again. And she never did call me again, and she had no reason to call me again. But I think it's that kind of cynical view of what her role is as a journalist. Now, there are some wonderful journalists out there, James Risen of the Times, Charlie Savage uh, of the Times. Uh, but sometimes I feel you can count them on the fingers of one hand, that the mainstream media is too busy giving you, and I would say this about the press until recently, because they're doing a very good job in dealing with Trump, I think, that 85% of what you read in the press, for the most part, is what the government wanted you to get. That's where they get their information. They get it essentially from government sources. A contrarian, a dissident out there, it's very difficult uh, to get your story uh, into the paper. Uh, and the Haspel, again, I hate to dwell on that one, but the Haspel uh, confirmation process is a very good example of that. If you go to uh, cable news, and I'll pick on liberal cable news, MSNBC is supposed to be a very liberal channel. That's nonsense. You know, who do they use as spokespeople whenever they write about the Central Intelligence Agency? They use uh, John McLaughlin, the former deputy director who was involved in the slam dunk statement that Tenet gave. He gave the slam dunk briefing. Leon Panetta, a former director. John Brennan, a former director. Michael Hayden, a former director. All of them who support the Haspel uh, confirmation. Uh, again, where are those people who are more critical or might give a, a different slant on a particular issue? You rarely see them. And I think that's true for most national security issues. Look at the role of retired generals on CNN, which was scandalous during Desert Storm because we found out they were being briefed at the Pentagon in the morning and going on television in the afternoon and the evening, basically repeating what they had learned in Pentagon briefings. Uh, so until we start pushing back against that, we're not going to get uh, all of 
the aspects of a particular story. Hmm. Do I see a realistic way out of the current trajectory? Uh, I try not to be cynical. I consider myself a skeptic. I worry about cynicism because I think cynicism is corrosive. Uh, you know, one of the books that we need is something that really explains the downfall of the Soviet Union. I've never seen a good authoritative account, but if I were to write one, I would start with the problem of cynicism that the Russian people no longer believed what the Russian leaders had to say. Uh, so there was no credibility on the part of the government, and I worry about that now. And I go back to the original, you know, the Colbert Report, you know, truthiness. We're getting a hell of a lot of truthiness. Um, but I still think that if you look at political participation, uh, which wasn't there in this election, uh, in part, uh, and it's kind of ironic, that it, liberals defeated Hillary Clinton as far as I'm concerned. It was people who refused to vote the top of the ticket. They went to vote, but they wouldn't vote the top of the ticket. Somehow they couldn't see the difference between a Hillary Clinton and a Donald Trump, which is amazing to me. Uh, or the, if you look at the number of votes that Jill Stein got and you think that 77,000 votes in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania meant defeat for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and maybe we needed that. I've often argued that you get the governments and the presidents you want and you deserve. Maybe we needed a wake-up call. And we're starting to see it in political participation. We're seeing it in the numbers of people who are running for office. We're seeing it in these uh, off-year uh, elections and how they're turning out, even when progressives have lost. They've lost by very narrow margins in places where they shouldn't even have come close, like the recent Arizona election. Um, I would hope to see it in terms of coalitions between Democrats and Republicans, and I thought the Haspel confirmation again would be one of those opportunities because you knew that John McCain, the, who has an iconic role when it comes to torture and abuse because of what happened to him, uh, that his letter would make a difference, but even the two people who were close to John McCain, his closest allies in the Senate, Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham, have already said they're going to vote for him. Um, I think we'll know in November what the answer <laughs> to that is in terms of can we correct? Uh, do we realize what we have at stake now? You know, going back to the question Benjamin Franklin got, of, you know, what have you done in there? and we've created a republic, if you can keep it. Um, and we're going to have to work harder at keeping it. And, and it was incredible to be at the student march in, in Washington to see what these kids have done. And I look at it as the possibility for generational change because this is a generation that's been traumatized by gun violence. We didn't do what we needed to do in terms of stopping the gun violence, uh, in terms of meaningful gun control. But these kids may get some of this done. Uh, and if they can translate that into getting young people out there to vote, uh, it could make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that story though, and he, he took the story beyond the evidence that he had. Uh, but he was right in that the CIA was witnessing the sale of drugs in California with the proceeds from those sales going to uh, the Contras, which was part of the illegal Iran-Contra program to begin with, but what was interesting about that uh, reporter, he didn't get the support he should have gotten from other major newspapers. Yeah, they, shut him down. they not only shut him down, they assigned reporters to repudiate what he wrote, to find evidence where he was wrong instead of looking for evidence where he was right. Um, and again, that's, that's one of the problems of the mainstream uh, media. Um, and that's why I cite someone like David Ignatius, who's been an apologist for her several decades, uh, and ver but very well known. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar with the program, and uh, I've used the ACLU myself uh, because, of, and this is another story I could have told, the CIA, in terms of slow reading, it took them 11 months to review and approve this manuscript. So I finally talked to the ACLU, and now I'm working with the ACLU on a larger freedom of speech issue that the government review process is really being used to shut down criticism. And a good example of that is Michael Hayden's book, which that just came out on intelligence, the assault on intelligence. And it's very attractive to the left because it deals with Trump's assault on intelligence, but it doesn't offer any criticism of the CIA or intelligence. Hayden was the director of NSA during 
search, illegal searches and seizures. He was the director of CIA during torture uh, and abuse. Um, the case involving the two Air Force contractors who the CIA used, uh, what needs to be understood about that, and I would use this against Haspel, there were so many CIA officers who wouldn't take part in that program. That was one of the reasons why they had to go outside to contractors, to bring people in who were willing to be sadistic enough to take part uh, in this program. And there's another aspect, I don't know if you saw it, uh, a few days ago there was a um, op-ed in the New York Times by a Libyan woman who uh, was picked up when her husband was picked up uh, and taken to a CIA se secret prison. She was pregnant and she was tortured. Uh, the British government yesterday issued an apology for their role that they played because they gave some documents to the Libyans that pointed falsely to the guilt of her husband. Not to her, but to her husband. They've apologized. Canada's apologized for its role in illegal renditions, which were amounted to kidnappings uh, in the streets of Europe and the Middle East. You've never seen the United States apologize for anything. And I think of the remarks that George H.W. Bush once said, uh, I would never apologize for the actions of the United States. And that's part of this problem of exceptionalism that uh, we don't apologize, you know. We, we see further and stand taller and we don't apologize. The question dealing with the original intent of the CIA and how it's been abused. Um, it's clear to me, and uh, I gave a talk at the Truman Library a few years ago and the archivist brought me in and gave me a, a note that w Harry Truman wrote. It was in his own hand and it was uh, months before he died, n not long before he died. Um, it was written in 63, and it was his anger with Eisenhower uh, and Kennedy, who he felt misused the CIA. And essentially what Truman argued, and it was turned into an op-ed that ran in the Washington uh, Post. I used it in an earlier book called Failure of Intelligence. He created the CIA for intelligence collection and intelligence analysis. And in his own hand, he said, I didn't want a cloak and dagger institution. I wanted an institution outside the policy process that would provide uh, careful, balanced assessments of the international community to principal officers uh, of the national security process. So it was very clear what he wanted. Uh, and at the end, not long before he died, he said, if I knew then what I know now about the CIA, I never would have created it in the first place. So what happened, happened unfortunately under Eisenhower, because Eisenhower is given a lot of credit which he deserves, for trying to control the role of the military, trying to control the military budget, uh, not believing things like the Gaither Report that had false accounts of Soviet air capabilities that I referred to uh, earlier. But unfortunately, what Eisenhower did to avoid using the military was to start using the CIAs in ways that Truman didn't intend. And of course, the key was 1953. Uh, and that's important now when you realize the problems we're going to have with Iran. 1953 was the year that British intelligence, MI6, came to us, came to CIA. Kermit Roosevelt, uh, a relative of Theodore Roosevelt, was the station chief. And they wanted help from the CIA in overthrowing the democratically elected government of Iran. That was Operation Ajax. There's a very good book on that by uh, Stephen um, Kinsler, New York Times correspondent. Uh, and I think that was the beginning of CIA's involvement in strategic operations that included regime change and assassination policy that was fully discussed in the Church Committee hearings and the Pike Committee hearings in 75 and 76. So until you get the CIA back to the role for which it was intended, intelligence collection, which I think is legitimate, and intelligence analysis, we're going to have the problems that we've had in Iran, uh, in the Congo, when Eisenhower approved the assassination of Lumumba, which led to the emergence of the worst tyrant in the history of African, modern African history, Mobutu, the Congo. Um, Chile, uh, Allende and the introduction of Pinochet. Uh, the killing, uh, even though Kennedy said he didn't realize we were gonna go that far, but the killing of Jiem in Vietnam in 63, which meant
The Vietnam War was lost before we ever committed a serious number of troops because we never had a government to work with. Uh, it wasn't a popular government, but it was the only viable, credible government that Vietnam had. After Giam, it was just a series of military generals who had no impact whatsoever. So it's getting them back to what Truman wanted, which I thought was legitimate. Uh, the danger is, is secret agencies and secret government. And that, again, that's why whistleblowers are important. There's too much secrecy. Uh, and if power can corrupt, imagine what secret power uh, can do. Um, I'm sure you're not familiar with the term stellar wind. Not many people are, but everyone knows about the massive surveillance program of NSA. That was a secret presidential finding. There was one copy. It ended up in the safe of David Addington. It was when James Comey found out about this and the illegal nature of it that he created some opposition. So we'd like to think that the system works. It, there's no system that works. There's people who make the system work. And how many James Comeys are you going to have? And I think that, that's part of the problem. And when you look at the CIA, I look at the directors they've had over the last, oh, I don't know, 30-some years. Uh, it's a rather mediocre collection. Uh, when you look at the, the ones who came from the Hill, uh, George Tennant, uh, Porter Goss, uh, Michael Pompeo, all involved in uh, politicizing intelligence. Uh, George Tennant was the one who said slam dunk to George Bush about uh, we can get you the intelligence to justify war in Iraq to take to the American people. Bush didn't want it. He wanted to take it to us, uh, to convince us of what he wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, but I think what the series uh, sh short change was, you know, when you think about the CIA, you have the operational directorate and you have the intelligence directorate. If you go to the Pentagon Papers, which have now all been uh, released, the annexes show you the uh, uh, national estimates and assessments that were done by the CIA during the Vietnam War, making it clear that the United States was going to fail. Mm -hmm. That escalation wasn't going to work, strategic bombing wasn't going to work, this was a civil war. All of the assumptions that the best and the brightest made uh, about that war, about Sino-Soviet cooperation, about uh, the internationalization of Vietnam, was all false. And I think the CIA properly identified the war uh, as a civil war in the context of a Ho Chi Minh who tried to approach Woodrow Wilson at Versailles in 1919 to appeal, just as he tried to appeal to Harry Truman after World War II for national unification of, of Vietnam. So if you think of Truman creating an intelligence organization, there the intelligence director did its job, but you know, if the tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, you know, if you have intelligence and no one reads it, uh, doesn't do much good. Well, those tapes, the tapes that they played in there where Johnson said, we can't win this war. Oh, he knew it. We have all the tapes of his conversations with Richard Russell, the head of the uh, Armed Forces Committee, who was his closest friend uh, in the Senate. And that's, that's the tragedy of it all. They sent Americans in harm's way knowing that eventually we'd have to get the hell out of there. And, you know, the Founding Fathers warned, and Eisenhower at his farewell address warned, that whenever you're in a, an environment of permanent war, you are going to sacrifice civil liberties. And when I think of the Fourth Amendment, uh, searches and seizures, the Eighth Amendment, torture and abuse, the Fifth Amendment, due process, the Sixth Amendment, free and fair trial, they've all been compromised during this period of permanent war, just as the James Madison warned and just as Eisenhower warned. So since 2001, we've been at war, and we've been at war with two authorizations that have nothing to do with the kinds of wars we're fighting now for the most part. Think of it, 2001, the authorization in October was to, to pursue Al-Qaeda and any terrorist group that had formed in Afghanistan. 2002 was the false authorization for Iraq. Well, we're fighting wars and using uh, significant lethal weaponry in 12 to 14 countries that have nothing to do with those two authorizations. Now, at least you have a bipartisan effort I don't think it's going anywhere, by Bob Corker uh, and Tim, Timothy Kane, Tim Kane, 
to go back to the War Powers Resolution to try to get a more active congressional role. And in fact, this goes back to that question of, you know, what, what do we do now? How can we get the whole system back to where it should be? And it's getting the Congress to be more active uh, because it's going to have to be attacked congressionally because you're not going to get anything from the courts on national security. Nas the courts, particularly this, this court and this particular alignment, will, s will sympathize with the government on all national security issues. Uh, in June, we're going to get, I think, a terrible verdict on the travel ban which has already been repudiated in federal courts, but I think the Supreme Court is going to go along with the President of the United States in the names of national security. He has a right uh, to uh, prevent uh, immigration to certain groups of people. Escalate from there. Yeah. Uh, so if you can't get our representatives engaged, but to be fair on that side of it, when you talk to staffers, uh, they will tell you they don't get calls from constituents on foreign policy, national security policy. They'll, if there are too many planes flying over their homes and ruining their barbecues in their backyard, they'll get a lot of mail. Uh, but when there's, it's time to vote on a $716 billion defense budget, they, they don't hear anything. Uh, so again, we, you know, you can't create change from your living room. We've got to get more active uh, in terms of change. Well, there, there are several. Uh, now remember, the director's role has been scaled back in the wake of 9-11. 9-11, uh, the CIA took the blame for a lot of 9-11 uh, as the intelligence failure. And so the, uh, and the, the misinformation about the Iraq war, the weapons of mass destruction. So they created a new layer of authority, the director of national intelligence. And for the most part, there have been generals, general officers who have been directors of national intelligence. But the constraints are, and here, uh, just as I described, the Pentagon is not being the institution of war that people assume because they've always argued against the use of military force. Remember, the excesses that we're talking about in this, of the CIA, regime change, uh, assassination policy, these again were civilian policies that came from the White House. These were presidents uh, who orchestrated these activities that the CIA then carried out. But in the wake of the Church Committee uh, hearings, the President had to sign uh, a presidential finding that would go to the Intelligence Committees to improve a covert action. So if you have an aggressive Intelligence Committee process, that's a, a restraint. Um, but again, I would count on the Oversight Committees, the Intelligence Committees, but right now, oversight is just that, it's oversight. It's being observed in the breach. You know, things just aren't being done in terms of real, legitimate uh, oversight. Yeah, you wonder, what, what, are you, what, aren't you, what aren't you being told? Exactly. Well, they claim that they had uh, memoranda from the yes. Justice Department, the torture memoranda. What they don't tell you are two things. One, they started torturing before they got the memoranda. The memoranda were written because George Tenet was getting very nervous, knowing that ultimately this activity was going to become known, uh, and they would have a lot to answer for. Mm -hmm. And then the point I made earlier, they went far beyond what the torture memoranda uh, talked about. Uh, so it was bad enough that they were written, but the fact is it started before the memoranda were written and exceeded what the mer uh, memoranda uh, talked about. But there, in, in, the case, in that case, there was no oversight by a committee. That is, the memos were in place, or the memos were in place, and then the director implemented. That's true, but you know, there, there are quarrels uh, I've heard on both sides here. Uh, CIA spokesmen and directors who claim that they briefed uh, committees. Yeah. Whether they briefed them fully on what was being done is another matter. And given what Dianne Feinstein learned, how presidents were lied, if presidents were lied to by the CIA, you know damn well congressional committees were lied to. And, you know, over the years, the CIA has played a lot of sleight of hand in its briefings. Uh, Bill Casey certainly did this with Iran-Contra. Um, you know, it, he made sure they did not have a full understanding of what Iran-Contra uh, was all about, which was a violation of laws on in two fronts. Uh, 
financial support for the Contras and selling arms to Iran that was engaged in, in terrorism. Um, yeah. You know, I go back to a book that now has become controversial, but that's uh, Hannah Arendt's The Banality of Evil, uh, about Eichmann. And why does someone who seems like a very ordinary individual throughout his lifetime turn into such an evil figure? How, how easy is it? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if, if these people were sadistic bullies or not, but they engaged in sadistic acts. And the torture tapes were destroyed because they were sadistic. And I think Rodriguez, who gave the order, and Hespel, who typed up the cable that went out to destroy the torture tapes, realized that there was greater risk in people seeing these tapes than in destroying them. Um, the big lie they tell is that they had to destroy the tapes because you had to protect the identities of people who conducted the torture. Well, that was a huge lie. They, they were hooded. There was no way you could look at anyone who's throughout history who's committed torture uh, has been hooded. And even this op-ed, the, the Libyan woman the other day talked about the hooded people who conducted the torture against a pregnant woman in this case. Um, and there were, there were people who refused to take part in the program, but there were too many people willing to do it. And even when the field came in with um, um, efforts to stop uh, interrogating certain people because they were convinced these people had nothing to offer, you got those people at the CIA who said, keep it up anyway. Uh, keep, you know, carry out the program. The, there's the debate now is the 92 torture tapes, one of the arguments is all 92 tapes deal with the torture, with the waterboarding of one man, Zubaydah, who was uh, waterboarded 83 times, you know, something ridiculous. If waterboarding works, why would you be doing this 83 times? And then, of course, you know, was she there on the site? Now, maybe she was, Haspel wasn't there for Zubaydah, but she was certainly there for Nashiri, who was involved in USS Cole attack in 2000, and he was waterboarded at least three times. Mm -hmm. And she was even asked at the hearings, I noticed, are, are you in those tapes? Were you, figured, <laughs> were you pictured in those tapes? And she assured people that she wasn't. Well, of course she would. No yeah. yeah, well, and I'm sure, you know, that's where you get to bully. I'm sure she, she wasn't on the site. Uh, you get someone else to do the dirty stuff. You don't do it yourself. Well, I wish I had some good news, Dorothy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have no more bad news. That's my, that's my good news. Well, thank you for giving up a nice Friday evening. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much.